Today's presentation will be given by Mary E. Gallagher, Amy and Alan Lewinstein Professor of Democracy, Democratization, and Human Rights Professor at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, where she's also the director of the Kenneth G. Lieberthal and Richard H. I. H. Rogel Center for Chinese Studies. Professor Gallagher received her PhD in politics in 2001 from Princeton University and her BA from Smith College in 1991. She was a foreign student in China in 1989 at Nanjing University. She also taught at the Foreign Affairs College in Beijing from 1996 to 1997. She was a Fulbright Research Scholar from 2003 through 2004 at East China University of Politics and Law in China in Shanghai. In 2012, she was a visiting professor at the Koguan School of Law at Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Her most recent book, Authoritarian Legality in China, Law Workers and the State, was published by Cambridge University in 2017. She's also the author and editor of several other books which I will skip in the interest of brevity. <laughs> Although I fear the consequences. Anyway, today she will be speaking on US-China relations in the age of Trump and Xi Jinping. Please join me in welcoming her. Um. Thank you for coming to my talk, and thank you, Par, for the nice uh, introduction. I don't know if I have control over the volume, but I can see. Um, so today I'm going to be talking, as you can see, on U.S.-China relations, which are a very hot topic. Um, it is not really my area of research. I, I research Chinese domestic politics, but uh, as somebody who has been involved in teaching on China in the United States for the last 20 years and has done a lot of work uh, in China and in the U.S. on um, teaching about China, understanding Chinese politics. Um, I have an investment in, um, in studying this problem or this topic. So basically today I'm going to make uh, three points. Um, these points are my own opinion about the topic and uh, I hope we can have a lot of discussion about them. And I'm going to end the talk with some what I'm calling earnest talk, like some recommendations that um, may or may not be uh, viable, but that are, um, I think, important to, to discuss. So the first point that I will be making, which I've made a lot on social media and to friends and colleagues, is that we should not think about the U.S.-China relationship right now in its current state, which is quite contentious, as all about Trump, Donald Trump, the current U.S. president, or all about Xi Jinping, the current Chinese president and general secretary of the Communist Party. So that's the first thing I'm going to talk about. Um, the second point I want to make is that engagement, which is the policy that the United States has taken since President Nixon visited China in 1971, with some minor exceptions, um, was not a failure if we correctly understand the point of the policy. Uh, so that's the th second thing I'm going to talk about. And then um, the third is that no matter what, uh, in terms of engagement being a success or, or a failure, um, currently U.S.-China relations are at an inflection point, a point where crisis or conflict is more likely um, for three <coughs> reasons. The changes in relative power between the United States and China, uh, the changes in China's, uh, China's scale, just simply how large China is as a country and the impact of China's rise on other countries, and then differences uh, of ideology um, between the United States and, and, uh, and China. So those are the three things I'm going to talk about. So first, Trump uh, and Xi as not, uh, not really the sole reason for why we see these, um, the current situation in, in the relationship. Um, I like to think about Trump as a consequence, not as a cause, although I am also going to uh, talk about things that the Trump administration has done that are particularly um, sort of making the relationship more contentious than previous administrations. Uh, but first, just starting out from this idea that um, with or without Trump, the relationship was bound to become more contentious. So the first thing I think that's important to remember is that political parties in the United States have been realigning over the issue of trade and globalization since the 1990s, um, starting with perhaps um, Bill Clinton's uh, decision to pursue a much more free trade policy compared to other democratic administrations, and at the end of the 1990s to push for China's accession to the World Trade Organization. Um, and that had impacts on um, political support for the Democratic Party in the United States, particularly among uh, 
white working class uh, voters. So this um, realignment has been happening uh, for a while, and it has it you know far precedes Trump. Trump capitalized on it, um, and I'll show some some things later in the talk about about his ability to use this issue. But it certainly precedes um, his administration. Um, and this gets to this new research that's being done among economists in the United States, sort of reevaluating the impact of what they call the China shock, which is China's accession to the WTO, uh, that although economists with the theory of comparative advantage will, have, will still argue that trade overall is mutually beneficial, that we fail to understand the real impact on certain um, regional economies and certain types uh, of workers in the United States. And in those places, Trump did particularly well in the 2016 election. Um, <clears throat> in addition to uh, the impact of WTO, we know that there's a lot of other reasons for why um, there's been a decline in manufacturing jobs. It's a perception that the United States is suffering from deindustrialization. A lot of global, a lot of advanced economies in the world um, have this um, as a political issue. Um, but in particular, uh, the, the vilification of China as the main cause of this problem, although we know, and, and many uh, economists and, and trade specialists, including one of my students who's in the back, Nicole Wu, has, has shown that it has a lot more to do with automation and technological uh, change than it does um, on, on China in particular, particularly over the broader period, the last few decades. <clears throat> We should also, I think, see Trump as part of a global trend. If you think about the rise of more autocratic leaders in advanced democracies, um, and this may be part of a backlash, a voter backlash against this perception of global elites and rising inequality within um, these advanced industrialized democracies. So Trump has capitalized on these issues, but he is not, um, he is not the cause. He is rather a consequence of, of these changes. Similarly, if we think about China and uh, Xi Jinping, who came to power in 2013 and is now in his second term of office, um, I think um, what I'm going to basically argue is that there was strong support in China for a stronger, more authoritative leader, particularly at the beginning of his term. Um, some people may regret that they wish that and supported him because of some of the changes he's made internally to the party. But uh, I don't think we should ignore that China also is going through some major kind of structural changes and uh, adjustments as its economy matures and, um, and slows down. So the Chinese economy, which had been growing at over 10% for about 40 years, is now growing at about 6%, which is the lowest uh, rate that we've seen um, since the beginning of the reform period, with, again, some minor exceptions. Uh, China is also experiencing really rapid uh, demographic change, particularly the aging of its population and um, adjustments to the one-child policy, which was relaxed a few years ago and has now been completely uh, discarded, have not, has not addressed this problem of demographic uh, change and, and shifts. <clears throat> so again, China is experiencing a slowdown, and it's the, what's called often in by Xi Jinping and other leaders as China's new normal, this adjustment to a more slowly growing economy and an aging society. Uh, I would also argue that Xi Jinping is not as secure of a leader as is commonly thought in the West and as portrayed in Western media accounts, and that uh, the Chinese Communist Party is particularly insecure about its ability to satisfy what I would call middle class expectations. And these middle class expectations among urban uh, Chinese citizens um, have grown, and they are much more sophisticated. They are not framed as wanting liberty and democracy and multi-party elections. They are more about quality of life issues and livelihood issues. So we think about food and drug safety, particularly the vaccine scandals that have happened or other types of, of food scandals that have riled um, Chinese urban middle class and their anger that the government has not addressed these issues. Uh, pollution, particularly air pollution, which can affect uh, the health uh, of everyone living there. It's very hard to protect yourself, uh, even if you're wealthy. And other environmental problems like water scarcity, water pollution. These are all things that people care a lot about and, and worry that the government has not adequately addressed these problems, um, partly because of, of the way in which the, the Communist Party makes policies and implements policies. And finally, over the broader <clears throat> scope of time, China is also undergoing very, very rapid urbanization of rural citizens into urban cities, into cities. 
And this is creating not really a conflict between citizens and the state, but rather citizens against other citizens. How will these resources be distributed? Who will benefit from moving into cities? How will local governments provide quality education and public goods to a rapidly growing urban population? And if you have been to China, and I'm, I know most many people in here are experts in China, um, this issue of, of, of public good provision and redistribution between urban and rural China is a really highly fraught issue. Um, there's been long term discrimination against rural citizens based on the hukou policy and as the hukou policy is gradually and very slowly dismantled <clears throat> the absorption of these uh, rural citizens into urban china is creating a lot of new political conflict um, and so these these um, issues again in the context of a slowing growth and in the context of slowing growth are really concerns for the party and they worry about the this crisis of legitimacy if they can't address them. Uh, when Xi Jinping took office, uh, as you might remember, there was a lot of expectation that he would be a, a reformer, not necessarily a political reformer. I don't think any Chinese leader ever wants to be called a political reformer um, in the media because you get labeled something like China's Gorbachev, which is like the worst possible thing to be labeled. Um, uh, but he was expected to be an economic reformer, at least. Um, there was this notion that vested interests within state-owned enterprises, within families, uh, were blocking major structural reforms that China had to do, and also that the party had become highly corrupt. So there was this perception that China was going to need a strong authoritative leader to um, bring China through this, this transition. So again, both Trump and Xi, I think, are part of um, broader historical changes that are happening differently in each country, but certainly mean that um, the conflict will, uh, will outlive both of them. On the other hand, I don't want to dismiss some of the changes that both administrations have done to make the, uh, the relationship much more difficult to manage. Um, so for Trump, if you think about who is making policy within the Trump administration, uh, many more seasoned sort of foreign policy experts in DC uh, with long experience in US-China relations, unfortunately, perhaps now, signed things like never Trump letters uh, and have not served in the Trump administration. Um, and partly because of his own sort of mercantilist views and his um, long kind of bashing of, of, of trade going back all the way to Japan in the 1980s, uh, Trump has surrounded himself with people who what we might call are China hawks, people who are anti-globalization. <clears throat> and that has had a huge impact on on the policy. On the other hand, I would say, surprisingly perhaps, there has been support for his more aggressive um, stance, particularly regarding trade with China, uh, from many other parts of the electorate that we would normally associate with the Democratic Party. And that goes back, of course, to the support in places like Michigan among white working class voters, but also from some trade unions and trade union leaders, uh, some corporations who believe they have been unfairly treated in China, uh, the military, which sees the expansion of the Navy, the US Navy and the Western Pacific as an advantage, and even some human rights advocates who, again, um, view Trump's more aggressive stance as helping their own policies. So even though we might think of his approach as rather chaotic, I'm sure Liu He thinks it's extremely chaotic, um, it's found actually remarkable bipartisan support. So again, it's actually in such a polarized political environment, it's, it's surprising to me that there's very little um, vocal opposition to Trump's China policy in DC. Um, everyone's, I think just today there was a, an essay by people at Brookings, but generally speaking, it's very muted. And it's also the case that because of this sort of uh, multifaceted, from many different angles, human rights or labor or, um, or uh, market access, that problems that used to be compartmentalized within the US-China relationship, like military conflict or the South China Sea, are now being viewed as a kind of comprehensive policy. Um, and in, in, most, in, in every regard, these policies have become more um, contentious and more aggressive in terms of um, trying to force China to change. Um, so one way to put it is, there are fewer panda huggers in Washington and there are more dragon slayers. 
or the panda huggers have turned into dragon slayers, or the panda huggers are being very quiet. I don't know what the word is in Beijing for these, for the same. Yeah, well, I meant, I meant something different, but yeah. Anyway, uh, okay, so Xi Jinping as well. Xi Jinping is a pretty remarkable Chinese leader. He uh, has done a number of surprising things since he took office that uh, bear some discussion. Um, the first thing that he did when he took office was he launched a massive anti-corruption campaign uh, against the party and local officials uh, and, has, and the military and has taken down major leaders, uh, including some former Politburo Standing Committee members. Uh, he has done this to, people have this debate in political science, is he doing it to clean up corruption or is he doing it to target his, his enemies? In a system that was highly corrupt, you can actually do both. You can clean up corruption and you can target your enemies. Uh, and that has boosted his support among parts of the population that saw uh, what, what was going on as very problematic and think of him as somebody who has, has cleaned uh, up the party. Uh, with that support going into his second term, Xi Jinping was able to push through a constitutional amendment that will allow him to serve uh, indefinitely. Prior to 2018 and since the 1990s, there had been a norm, uh, and then it was written into the constitution of the president and the premier serving two five-year terms. The party, the Communist Party does not have term limits, and so in a sense what happened is that the party and the government were put into alignment with no term limits. But it effectively means that when his second term ends, he can continue to serve another five-year term, he can continue to serve a fourth term. We, there is a, a lot of uncertainty, not only about when he will step down, but there's also a lot of uncertainty about how he will step down and how a, how a successor will be chosen. Uh, this is a major change, um, and it has made um, internal opposition to Xi in the party much more difficult to, to vocalize, because you don't know when he's going to leave. Um, in terms of relations with uh, society, including universities, uh, Xi Jinping has reasserted ideological control of the party with clampdowns on textbooks, on things that are discussed in the classroom. I wouldn't necessarily put all of this on uh, him as an individual leader because some of these trends, I think, were happening at, in the late Hu Jintao period as well. But because of his greater power and standing, he has able to, he's been more successful, I think, in in addressing um, this, this kind of ideological laxity that he, was, he has complained about in speeches. Um, if you have been studying China for a long time, I study labor, so I study labor protests. So one of the ways that Hu Jintao and even Jiang Zemin before him talked about the threat to Chinese um, uh, political, that China's political system was this issue of social stability and that the party needed to maintain social stability in order to continue economic development. Uh, the, the, the former president, Hu Jintao, was very um, often conciliatory, conciliatory with uh, protests that were deemed legitimate. So things like uh, environmental or labor protests and sometimes land protests that were, um, that, th th that were part of um, economic reform and transition were treated not leniently necessarily, but often with some sort of compromise and concessions. Um, on the other hand, Xi Jinping has really focused not so much on containing social stability, but rather focused on national security. And, and in, in, the, in the case of labor, making labor protests and, and labor NGOs as a threat of national security, often with you know, underhanded um, support from uh, activists in Hong Kong or in the United States. So he sort of reframed the debate about social stability to be one more about um, a threat from outside, from external um, enemies. Xi Jinping has also reversed Deng Xiaoping's foreign policy stance of biding time and hiding capabilities. Uh, this was something that, again, Deng Xiaoping talked about in the 1980s as uh, a, reverse, a reversal of Mao's more contentious and uh, revolutionary policy vis-a-vis -vis many third world countries at the time, um, and really focused on China's internal development. Uh, Xi Jinping, for, other, for, for many reasons, some actually economic in terms of the need to spend money and the need to um, 
deal with overcapacity has been much more uh, pursuing kind of a global uh, role for China, a much more ambitious global role for China. And this includes things that you've probably read in the media, things like Belt and Road Initiative, which is this infrastructure project uh, going uh, across Central Asia and into Southeast Asia. It has both kind of land and as well as um, sea routes. <clears throat> the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, which is seen as a um, not as necessarily as a substitute, but as a complement to other international institutions like the World Bank and the IMF. And then in terms of the military, uh, military installations in the South China Sea uh, and a much more aggressive um, assertion of territorial control around the islands in the South China Sea. So both uh, Xi Jinping and Trump have taken a more aggressive stance vis-a-vis -vis the other country. There are reasons for taking those stances that can be attributed to domestic politics within both countries, the new normal, the slowing down of China's growth, um, but also, and, and for the United States, the changes in the electorate. Um, and so we shouldn't ignore these, these, um, the things that the leaders have done, but rather, you know, again, framing them as something that is about these broader structural changes in, um, in both countries. So the second point I want to make is that, and this is, I'm not going to go into a lot about the history of, of engagement, but uh, a couple of years ago, members of the Obama administration, former members of the Obama administration, wrote an essay in Foreign Affairs, uh, basically declaring that the engagement policy that the United States had taken from President Nixon to Obama uh, had failed. It had failed to basically make China into a modern democratic country. Um, I would argue that it is mistaken to assume or to posit that engagement was about making China democratic. It's certainly the case that people in speeches, including some politicians, said that that was going to happen. Uh, I think Bill Clinton said that. I think many multinational corporation leaders said that when they were investing in China, that this was going to make China democratic. Um, but engagement policy, if we look at the people who were advocating uh, for it at the time and even into the Obama administration, it was really an engagement policy that was intended to incorporate China into the global economy and to global economic institutions. And if we think about that as the metric, <clears throat> then uh, engagement has been a success. Might have been too successful in the sense of China has done this dramatically well in terms of its integration into the global economy. Uh, I want to just show you a um, a quote that came from a former director of the China Center, Mike Oxenberg, who I did not overlap with when I was, since I've been at Michigan, he passed away in 2001. But what he wrote, and I found this this summer when I was researching um, some letters that had uh, gone back and forth between Mike Oxenberg when he was director of the China Center in 89 to 91, and Wang Huning, who is now a Politburo Standing Committee member, uh, and at the time was a visiting scholar in the United States. <clears throat> Uh, so this was, of course, overlapping with the Tiananmen incident and the suppression of the student movement in Beijing and other cities. And Oxenberg, who had advised um, other administrations uh, prior to this, including Nixon and Carter, had then also um, testified in front of Congress in the summer of 89, right after the crackdown and then wrote this um, essay in Foreign Affairs in the summer of 1991. So we have been debating engagement since the 80s, right? This is not a new um, problem in US-China relations about why do we engage in China and why, do we try to, uh, why did we try to bring China out of, um, out of relative isolation after the Cultural Revolution. And so what he wrote in, in this essay was, finally, America has only limited influence on China's internal affairs, yet for reasons that have fascinated successive generations of historians, America has periodically sought to produce a China more to its liking. The efforts have always ended in massive failure. The United States still seems trapped in a cycle of a love-hate relationship with China. It seems reluctant to acknowledge the obvious. China represents a distinct and proud civilization whose search for modernity will continue to be punctuated by calamity and tragedy, hopefully that's not the case, and whose necessary incorporation into world affairs will require years of effort. So in a sense, this is one of the architects of the engagement policy that began under Nixon, saying as early as 1991, we are not going to be able to change. China. China may change, but it is not going to be because the United States forces it to do so.
So I would argue then, just going back, that we should think of about engagement policy as a success. And then the question now is, now that we have successfully helped China move from this period of relative isolation into global integration, uh, what do we do now? I would also argue, just as an aside, about um, whether or not economic development has transformed China as was expected by some people, this idea that as a country gets wealthier, it becomes more likely to be democratic. Uh, anyone who started going to China in the 1980s or 70s and goes to China now understands that economic development has had a major transformative effect on China. Uh, and whether that means ultimately will China go through some sort of political transition, we don't know. But I think it's very hard to deny the, the idea that economic development hasn't had this major impact. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about, which um, I'll, leave, I'll make sure to leave plenty of time for discussion, um, is this idea of an inflection point. And the way I teach about it in um, the Chinese politics class I teach, and I'm sorry if students are here now, you're going to hear me repeat this at the end of the semester, is that we can think about the, uh, the problem of U.S.-China relations in the context of a rising China in three ways, and all three to me anyway, s imply that our relationship with China will be more fraught and more contentious from here on out. One is the issue of scale, and this is partly about engagement success, how successful China has been. Uh, one is about relative power, and the other is about, the last is about ideology. So in all three, no matter what, if we just think about it, okay, it's just because China's big, it's gonna be hard to absorb, yes. It's also about relative power and the fact that U.S. power in, in relative terms to China's power is in decline, yes. And then in terms of our ideological system, both politically and economically are different, yes. Oh, so I, if you're interested more in the China shock, they have a nice website. I was going to see if I could link to it, but I didn't practice it before. So. So this is uh, a group of economists doing this research. They have this nice article in the Wall Street Journal uh, where they measure the impact of the China shock, which is China's accession into the WTO. So if you're interested, you can look at this and you can play around with different counties <clears throat> and sort of see the impact. Um, if you look at automotives, if you look at furniture, if you look at textiles down in the southeast. Um, and there's other research tying some of the trends to support for Trump in 2016, as well as, as, well as some other um, changes. So in terms of scale, as you probably already expect, the scale of China's um, economic development has been massive. And uh, I'm going to take some statistics from a recent essay by Arthur Krober, who also has a book called something like China's Economy, What Everybody Needs to Know. It's, it's a good book. Um, per capita income in China has risen since 1978 from about 300 US dollars to something like 8,200. Depending on how you measure it, it can be much higher uh, in 2017. The number of Chinese people living in absolute poverty has gone from something like 750 million to about 10 million. And the middle class, with these rising expectations has risen from effectively zero at the beginning of reform to about 200 million people if you measure it according to the World Bank. Um, as he shows, and this chart also sort of demonstrates some of the ways in which China's impact has been disruptive, um, it is now the second largest economy in the world. Uh, if you look at, depending on how you measure it, it can be considered the largest economy. It is certainly the largest trading nation in the world. It is the most important trading partners, partner of over 40 countries, including many US allies, whereas the United States is the most important trading partner of about 30 countries. It is the largest importer of oil, and it is the largest emitter of the carbon dioxide that's attributed to global climate change. So when we think about scale, this is a major disruptive impact, and it is even without the ideological problems or the problems of relative power, China's rise has been disruptive to the global economy. It has also been incredibly successful and it has been incredibly beneficial to many people in China as well as many people outside of China. If we think about relative power, 
and the changes in um, both economic and military terms. Clearly from the previous slide, China is now a global economic power, and it is also a strong military power, particularly in East Asia. So if we think about the relative power changes between China and the United States uh, in every aspect, economic or military, uh, China's relative power has increased while the gap between the US and, the, and China has grown smaller. Um, so if you are a what we would call a structural realist in political science, and if you've read Graham Allison's book or the article the th about Thucydides' trap, do these changes in relative power dictate conflict? Structural realists say yes. That it's simply a problem of the, the, the declining gap in relative power that will dictate um, conflict between the US and China. And we see this reflected in the Trump administration's uh, policies towards China, which are very zero-sum, which seem to imply that any gain for China is a loss in the United States. Um, this is part, I think, just of Trump's thinking, because he also exhibited this in the 80s about Japan, which he, uh, he was also highly critical. Um, but it also within it has the potential for a self-fulfilling prophecy and a kind of a security dilemma where every attempt by the United States to reassure itself and to keep its security will undermine uh, China's feeling of security and a kind of vicious circle and a vicious cycle of, um, of conflict. So relative power is also, I think, another reason for why we should expect more um, tension. And then ideology. Now, previously we might have thought that it's really the political issue, right? It's the issue that China is not a democracy that makes it difficult for US-China relations to go smoothly. Uh, many people in political science as well as some foreign policymakers believe that it's easier to make policy with a democracy and that dem democratic countries are less likely to fight militarily, that they, can ha they have other institutions by which they can um, uh, figure out their, their issues and their problems. Um, I would argue at this point really the, the main or the more important problem between ide ideology and U.S.-China relations is the economic differences and particularly the reassertion of, um, of party control and also political control of the economy since about 2008 with the global financial crisis when kind of liberal internationalism and financial deregulation uh, suffered a um, reputational hit after the, the crisis. Um, so in China, the, what's often called a kind of state capitalist mode of, of economic uh, rule, where the state maintains ownership in the commanding heights of the economy, such as telecommunications, uh, natural resources. And we've actually seen a reassertion of state-owned enterprises since that period of time. And so again, it doesn't seem as if China is moving in a, in a it, converging with the international economy, but rather reasserting state control. Um, also limits to market access, particularly for foreign firms that um, specialize in things that Chinese firms don't do well, for example, financial services or healthcare, things like that. And so this has been another point of contention, particularly um, with the trade conflict. And then as you've read, uh, violations of intellectual property and forced technological um, transfer. <clears throat> and this has been highlighted recently with, with Huawei. Um, single party rule has long been a kind of sticking point between the United States and China. This was highlighted in the Tiananmen incident in 89 where students um, demanded political change. Uh, but we've seen again a more, uh, dis despite sort of a trend of glowing liber growing liberalization and um, increasing sort of personal freedoms in China since again around the time that Xi Jinping took office and maybe slightly earlier, uh, a reassertion of, of single party rule and a reassertion of ideological um, control by the party, more effective censorship, uh, and a lack of freedom of religion, which has been highlighted in Xinjiang and the, the vocational training camps or the re-education camps of uh, Muslim minorities, as well as a lack of freedom of association. And this is highlighted by the uh, crackdown on uh, lawyers as well as labor activists over the past few years. Um, so again, even if we're looking at ideology, 
relative power or scale in all of these three realms, the relationship is likely to become and continue to be more fraught. So what are the options? I mean, this is basically what are the options besides engagement? Uh, engagement with, uh, between the two countries despite all of these problems. Uh, one thing that people talk about is decoupling. So decoupling is this idea that the two economies basically try to uh, move away from economic interdependence, a kind of new Cold War or new, some people call it a new tech war where things are basically uh, removed from China. Um, this was highlighted not just with Huawei, but ZTE earlier, where the United States has tried to reassert its ability to shut down uh, Chinese firms that they consider to be violating uh, practices, international practices. Decoupling of the two economies, if possible, would mean major catastrophic effects on the global economy on the economies of both the United States and China. It would massively disrupt global supply chains, as you can imagine. Um, <clears throat> and it would make everybody worse off. It would also probably force some of our allies in East Asia to choose sides. So you would be asking a country like South Korea, that is major trading partner is China or Japan, to choose which, if we are going to decouple, which side are you going to be on, as well as Australia. So decoupling would disrupt not only the global economy, it would probably also disrupt some of the political alliances that the United States has formed since World War II. Another um, possibility uh, has been mentioned by several people is this notion of competitive coexistence, which is, I would say, like a middle ground between decoupling and engagement. Um, so this kind of is not quite full decoupling, but it is um, a way in which we uh, basically see China as a, as a major competitor and not as a, a country that we would be dependent on or um, engaged with fully as we are now. Competitive coexistence, I think, has some problems because it assumes that uh, the rules of the games are set. But actually, one of the things that we are in conflict over are the rules of the game. Right? How should the global economy be managed? How should uh, infrastructure be built in Central Asia, how should loans be given to African countries. In all of these areas, there is um, a need for China and the United States and these global international institutions like the World Bank, IMF, the ones that China has recently created, like the AAIB, um, to, to negotiate. And so competitive coexistence is not really possible if the rules of the game are still being contested. I think also this competitive coexistence would still force other countries to choose sides, right? Which side are you going to be on if this is just a competition and not a collaboration? And competition without engagement is likely to lead to further distrust and misperception, uh, which again is one of the fears that this kind of security dilemma between the two countries where both countries are starting to feel less secure and more fearful about the intentions of the other, uh, that without engagement, competitive coexistence is more likely to lead to military conflict. We could also think about something like, well, maybe we should, maybe the United States should alter the relative power between the two countries, you know, do something that would weaken China. We want to think about this really carefully, I think. Is a weaker China better? Is a weaker China more stable? Is a weaker China a better international actor? Maybe, but I don't think we can be clear that that's the case. Maybe we could try to, again, alter China's ideology, persuade that it should become democratic, force it to be democratic with sanctions and things like that. These are all discussed in the 80s and the 90s, particularly after Tiananmen. And then we want to think about, is a democratic China better? <laughs> Maybe. I actually think it would be, but. Could we be sure? Would a, would a democratic China be less nationalistic? If people could run for office on certain platforms, like liberate Taiwan? I think the most important thing, and this is a very obvious statement, is that a lot of the discussion about containment or, pull, or, or not engaging or competing with China 
assumes something that we all know is not true, which is China is not the Soviet Union. And if the Communist Party would fall from power, China would still exist. And it would still exist at the same scale that it is at now. So when we think about, or people fly policy balloons about containment, changing China's ideology, cha changing the relative power uh, status between the two countries, we should remember that this is not the Soviet Union, that this is not a country that is going to disappear. So my earnest recommendations, uh, some of them have been mentioned by other people. I think they're not particularly mind-boggling or very controversial. Um, but you will note, as I go through them, they are not being done by the Trump administration. In fact, the Trump administration is doing the opposite. So we should strengthen and extend existing international institutions. Uh, I think it's uh, too bad that both Clinton, Hillary Clinton and Trump campaigned uh, and opposing the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, and Trump, of course, in one of his first uh, actions on the job was to, um, to pull out. So um, this is another free trade agreement that brought together many Asian countries and the United States. It did not include China at the time. Um, with the United States withdrawal, there have been um, attempts by Japan to go forward with Trans-Pacific Partnership, and China has also launched its own sort of alternative to, um, to the TPP. I think that the United States should emphasize universal values such as human rights and the freedom of religion. And I also think in particular, in regards to China, we should emphasize rights that are guaranteed in the Chinese constitution. These are not things that China does not promise its citizens. These are already in the constitution. This is something that Trump really doesn't do well. He should build coalitions, or we, the US government, should build coalitions of allies and like-minded countries to rein in behavior that contravenes international norms, whether it's about Xinjiang or it's about market access, and that this is really important in order to um, demonstrate to the Xi Jinping administration that there is a consensus uh, among many countries that some of the behavior that China has taken recently is problematic. But again, this is not something that Trump has done. Instead, Trump has launched trade wars not only against China, but against other countries that we are allies with, like Japan and the EU and Canada. I also think that maybe the United States likes having an enemy, and we actually perform better when we have an enemy. So if we're going to make China into an enemy or a frenemy, maybe it would be better. Uh, we should emphasize competition where it helps the United States, like education. Chinese education does th some things very, very well. I'm a paper tiger mother. I would like to be a tiger mother, but I'm really only a paper tiger mother. Um, and I think in basic research and development, the United States, we've really cut those things, whereas China has continued to invest. Uh, we should emphasize that, that these are things that China is doing better than us. I think in infrastructure, this is, again, a big political issue in the United States. We should bring Congress and other politicians to see that when you have a, a lot of population density, I'm not saying everywhere in the United States, I've been on a high-speed rail in Xinjiang, which seemed maybe not the best investment, but um, this is another area where we could have uh, some healthy competition. And if you think about things that are related to technology and um, things that are being debated right now around 5G, uh, in some ways China has done a better job because of its ability to plan long term. And this is another area where the United States could learn something from the Chinese system. So as you've noticed, and like I said, most of these things are not only not being done by the Trump administration, they are being undone by the Trump administration. And <clears throat> instead of emphasizing multilateralism and alliances, he has emphasized unilateralism. He has alienated allies in Asia and Europe. And he's disregarded the most important aspects of American moral foreign policy when we talk about things like universal values. Um, so, but like I said, I, what I want to emphasize in, the in, in this talk is that it's not just about Trump. These, these issues will, will outlive his presidency, whether it's 2012 or another term, 
Um, and it, <clears throat> it's really important, I think, to emphasize that engagement has not been a failure. Engagement has been a success. And the key is now is to figure out what to do with the success. So thank you. The floor is now open for questions, and we will have two pe people with mics. It's Ina on the on my right. So okay, um, I have to leave shortly. That's why I have to uh, grab this opportunity. Uh, is this on? Yeah, <coughs> Testing. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you so much for such a, a nice and clear uh, delineation of a very messy situation right now. Um, your focus is on the U.S. policy and uh, towards China. My question will shift away uh, more towards the field of China studies. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, this, this field emerged as a consequence of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. So in the field for a long time, scholars more or less kind of aligned um, either your pro-communist revolution or mm -hmm. anti-communist revolution. So that um, dichotomy no longer is no longer valid, right? Because the, the situation on the ground has rapidly changed and Deng Xiaoping abandoned pursuit of a communist agenda a long time ago. So now we see that I totally agree with you, it's not engagement was failure, but too successful to the extent that the US uh, successfully or global capitalists successfully uh, enhance the muscle of an ancient empire. Mm. So now it's revived. As Xi Jinping articulated clearly, we want to restore the glory of ancient civilization mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. China, right? So it's revived. So now uh, we are in a stage of we see it's the clashes of, of the empires, right? The, U.S. empire now with the emerging Chinese empire. So my question to the field is that, uh, um, do you see signs of scholars in our field, China studies, uh, really keeping their sensitivity or curiosity or in tune to this rapid shifting transformation and producing any really important <coughs> uh, new scholarship that reflecting the rapidly changing ground. I'd like to hear that mm -hmm. from you. Th uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I think within the US kind of China studies, which is the one I know better, I don't think I have a good sense of necessarily what it's like in Europe or Japan. Um, I think that l perhaps similar to this period much earlier during the Cold War, <clears throat> and I really started studying China only at the very end of the Cold War, that um, there is a sense of um, you know, needing to choose sides, perhaps, you know, whether you're a dragon slayer or uh, a panda hugger, and uh, less nuance. So even with regard to what Xi Jinping has announced as um, you know, uh, his, his ambition for, for China globally, I mean, it's not surprising that China, given uh, how much it has developed and and how important it is to the global economy that they wouldn't want to do things like s either change the existing international institutions, like get more voting rights at the World Bank or the IMF, or set up an alternative bank. Those things, I think, are normal. And I think the Obama administration was wrong in opposing setting up the AAIB, and again, forced uh, our, our countries that we have alliances with to choose sides in a really unfortunate way. And again, demonstrated to China, like, oh, it's not just that it really is that the United States wants to contain China, which is the fear. So this is kind of mutual distrust that feeds this, this uh, problem. I don't think that everyone in China agrees with Xi Jinping, including people within the party, that China somehow should uh, try to assert a, a kind of um, imperial power or global hegemonic power. I mean, may, I'm sure there are people in China who want to do that. Uh, perhaps Xi Jinping is one of them. But I think that it's better to emphasize that there's a lot more nuance and there's a lot more disagreement within China internally about China's global role. Okay, any more questions? Uh, can you please keep them brief? We only have 25 minutes. 
Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. My question uh, uh, is focused on the international academic community. What do you see the impact of the current administrations, both in China and here, on our exchanges, on how the students uh, are um, reunited back in, at the motherland, the Chinese <laughs> students that are here? Because I know there's a big push for those students to come back. What's the impact on them? And how is this whole um, uh, trade war, whatever, going to impact our international educational community? Um, I think that's a really good question. I think it so far, I've already you see a chilling effect on um, Chinese students coming to the United States um, with restrictions in some cases, I think, on them getting visas, on them allow being allowed to stay longer to work after they graduate. Um, uh, a sense, and this has been been pushed, I think, this has been definitely pushed by people within the Trump administration as well as within the FBI of this kind of non-traditional <coughs> espionage or, um, uh, what did he call it, all society <coughs> attempt to um, steal uh, national security and, and technology. Uh, I'm sure that happens. I don't think it happens as frequently as the government believes. And I think longer term that the chilling effect on educational exchange and um, the United States as an open society is is more problematic. Maybe I'm naive, but that's what I think. And the Chinese are the, the Chinese government going to be putting more restriction on to their. I'm sorry. Are the is the Chinese government going to be putting more restrictions on their students when they go abroad? Um, maybe I don't I don't know. I think that there's always been. Uh, restrictions for the, the the thing is is that there are hundreds of thousands of Chinese students uh, abroad in the United States and other countries getting education including now at the secondary level in, in, in schools uh, in, in secondary schools and that is not orchestrated by the Chinese government again this is about middle-class expectations in China and people's unhappiness with the current educational system in China, particularly college and, or university. So again, I think this is the United States wasting some of our most important um, resources and our kind of international credibility on, on, on being, becoming a more closed society. And this is, you know, this is particularly problematic in the Trump administration. That's a, a, that's a key difference compared to other administrations. Um, so you mentioned earlier in your presentation that the United States should not treat China the same as how it treated uh, the Soviet Union back during this uh, Cold War, and it should not seek to contain the influence of China or in some way influence the ideology of China. But then, as I saw in the four uh, recommendations you brought up, brought up toward the end, uh, I feel like that at least three of them are seeking to achieve such ends. So. Uh, I guess I'm just wondering, like, could you clarify a little bit of what your, like, vision of how the U.S.-China relationship should be in the future? Well, I think out of all of those points, the, the most, um, most of those points were emphasizing this idea that there are global international institutions and norms about how to regulate the economy, about how to protect national security in a, in a, global, in a global world, things like that, and that there are practices and institutions that help countries do that. And keeping China and the United States both involved is very, very important to maintaining that system. Um, and I read, there was a recent a RAND paper, I've read a lot of stuff about what, it's all very pessimistic, I was reading all this stuff, but one, one RAND paper said, comparing this Russia and China right now, not Soviet Union, but Russia and China, said that Russia is not a peer country, but it is a rogue nation, whereas China is a peer, but not a rogue. So if we think about, like, it's really, if we think about who is, or which countries are most disruptive to global economic and political order, it's, it's Russia, not China, but China is much more powerful than Russia. Um, so all of those things that I was trying to emphasize were not about the U.S. unilaterally trying to change China, which is what I think is, is the current position of the U.S. Um, government in, under the Trump administration. The only one I think that is different is emphasizing universal values. And I think, and, and again, I said we should be careful about um, emphasizing those things that the Chinese Constitution already guarantees, rather than something like you should do multi-party elections, right? 
the Communist Party is not going to do multi-party elections. But will the Communist Party guarantee freedom of religion? I mean, it's in the Constitution. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, sharing your views with us. <coughs> for the first time in my life, uh, during the past year or two, I am for real concerned about the prospect for a military conflict, which might lead to nuclear conflict between my two beloved nations and their people. History doesn't lend me any optimism as well. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Grant Allison recently wrote a book, cited 16 cases in the last 500 plus years of number two, uh, trying to catch up number one, <coughs> 75% of which ended up in war. What is your view about my growing concern of a <laughs> military conflict? Uh, I share that concern. Um, I think that the concern is heightened by what I was trying to convey as a kind of security dilemma where there is growing mistrust and lack of um, uh, engagement and and contact between the two governments in a healthy way that will kind of dissipate some of that uh, risk. I think it's a, something that has to be managed and structural realists who think about this as uh, a rising power, what it, Allison's term is an irresistible force meets an unmovable object, right? So China's the irresistible force, the US is the unmovable object. That assumes, I think, way too much to structure as opposed to the agency of politicians as well as other people, which is why I guess I'm giving the talk. Thank you, Mary. Um, I have a question on the ideological confrontation you mentioned the third dimension uh, of the conflict. Um, I think that in recent years, uh, what's different about the uh, ideological confrontation between the two countries is that, um, um, from my point of view, it's largely initiated by China. For example, uh, like uh, Trump tweeted that uh, he finds the China 2025 uh, initiative insulting, personally, and uh, you know, Belt and Road and stuff like that. And then now, uh, because of the trade war and because of the tension, there's a lot of voices um, within China saying that China should go back to the uh, another area of uh, Deng Xiaoping low prof, uh, low mm -hmm. key, and then keep mm -hmm. growing Tao Guang Yanghui period. Mm -hmm. um, so if they actually do that, and then the Trump administration is not emphasizing human rights as much, it seems there's just no major issue uh, supporting the uh, ideological confrontation. So probably on that front, it's going to be uh, easier to defuse uh, the situation. What is your uh, evaluation on that? For example, what do you think of the role of um, who is the who is the one uh, the the professor from Fudan? Um, Wang Huning. Yeah, yeah. What about his role in the future in the coming years? And uh, what about the you know nationalist plans of China? Yeah. So I I'm not sure I understand. So you think that so if if China sort of reverted back to a more a less assertive foreign policy that this ideological con problem would, would dissipate. Um, I, that's probably true. I mean, it certainly has been the case that um, under previous administrations, Hu Jintao, previous Chinese administrations, that there was far less uh, conflict because uh, China was not doing those things. I, th I think the other problem, though, and this is what I meant about these other changes, China, Belt and Road, um, which I think I agree with my colleague um, Yuan Yuan Ang, who argued it's it's more of a it's a slogan. It's not really a, a, a policy or a strategy. It's very dispersed in terms of, of what's going on in terms with Belt and Road. Is that there are reasons domestically for why China needs to um, go out in terms of investment, in terms of building infrastructure, in order to maintain economic growth at a level that its population has become accustomed to. So I don't think it's possible that China can really revert to uh, um, a, a foreign policy position that isn't commensurate with its role. And I think the Kroeber table, which is sort of the, the uh, multi-dimensions of what people are calling the China shock in terms of 
carbon emissions or oil, things like that. I mean, China is such a large global actor in every case, in every issue area. I don't under, I don't think it's possible for it to to not have a more, not necessarily aggressive foreign policy. If you want to, if you want to call Xi Jinping's foreign policy aggressive, which I think many people would, uh, but even even a, they need to have a foreign policy that is commensurate with its with its role. Thanks for the presentation. Um, my question is going to be on um, globalization mostly. So we're seeing in the last couple of years that China is uh, mostly embracing uh, globalization around the world while the US is now kind of going into this like isolationist um, kind of view. Uh, so mm -hmm. is there a way possibly uh, that the US can kind of like uh, be back in this kind of like um, sphere of like being open to uh, other global markets instead of being um, isolationist, and uh, if they do so, if the U.S. does so, um, how how would it be different? I'm not as pessim. I mean, partly because I'm American, I guess I'm not as pessimistic about the United <coughs> States as I think many people abroad are, because if you see it from afar, it just seems very disturbing. Um, I am not an American politics expert, and so I'd already like waved in, weighed into um, international relations, which is also not my area. So I was particularly hesitant to get too much into American politics. But I think again, um, there's something going on in American politics related to the realignment of the political parties, and that has something to do with broader demographic changes in the United States. For example, becoming a majority minority country within the next few decades. So I would imagine that as the United States goes in that direction, um, its, its role globally will also change and hopefully for the better. So yeah, that's again, maybe naive, but that's what I think. Hi, uh, over here. Thanks. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's um, very, I was, <laughs> <laughs> there are two microphones. A um, couple questions. I was curious, uh, you, you pointed out the strange bedfellows trade unions. Uh, I can understand their position because of uh, tariffs uh, uh, helping out uh, industries here. But you mentioned um, uh, military and human rights organizations that have also joined. <laughs> and I was curious who the, the military, you know, because in terms of, of Trump's position withdrawing from the Pacific area and not trying to confront China on the, uh, on the islands and so forth. So I was puzzled about that, and also human rights. And on the other hand, I also have a question about uh, ownership of debt, China's tremendous ownership of, of debt, uh, U.S. debt. How does that, what role does that play in terms of this whole, whole picture, you know? So to address the, first, the, sec the last part first, the, um, the purchasing of U.S. Treasury bonds by China is part, partly a function of our economic interdependence and the fact that we buy more from China than it buys from us. Um, the Chinese government has tried to reduce its, um, its um, foreign currency reserves and as well, in particular, its ownership of treasuries. So those have gone down. Um, but I think, again, it's another way in which the economies uh, and the two countries are so intertwined that it's a difficult thing to extract or decouple from. Um, over the longer term, I suppose it's possible that there will be this attempt. Uh, and if there is such an attempt, that will, I, I don't think we should ignore the impact that will have on China domestically because a lot of the global supply chains that are in China now are certainly um, helping Chinese private businesses grow, but they are also um, dominated by a lot of foreign companies that have invested in China, including Taiwanese, Japanese, South Korean companies. And that kind of uh, decoupling would really have a devastating effect on, on China's ability to be an export powerhouse, which, again, if that happened, then it wouldn't have to buy uh, our debt and ha what that would mean for the United States and our, our own ability to um, grow these huge uh, budget deficits, particularly in the last few years. But now I've forgotten your first question. The question about the human rights and the, and the military, how they have supported um, uh, Trump's uh, approach to um, you know tariffs and and, and uh I think there are certainly within the military. What I meant was that that if the United States is going to maintain its 
role in the Western Pacific as it has since World War II. This will require a huge expansion of the military, it, it, and it has already started to expand the military budget and, um, and expand the U.S. presence in other parts of Asia, including India and, and, and Australia. Um, and I think there are some parts of the military that are, would be in favor of that. Um, in terms of human rights, it's always been interesting to me that for human rights advocates, if we're talking about um, uh, abortion opponents or aspects about labor activism or um, human rights and dissidents, there has always been a, <clears throat> if we think about sort of le the, the Democratic Party on the left and the Republican Party on the right, there's always been a part of the Democratic Party that's concerned with things like human rights that have allied themselves at certain times with, with Republican administrations. So, and again, I think Trump was able to capitalize on that, although he hasn't been particularly outspoken about human rights issues himself personally. But within Congress, you've certainly seen more attention to issues like, like Xinjiang um, because of this. Again, lots of people have different issues with China within the United States policymaking world. And I think what he's managed to do is find support from these disparate groups. Hi, Mary. Over on the far left. <laughs> Thank um, you. Thanks for your talk. So my question is kind of about what is China's desired place in the world? So you mentioned how they've gained a lot from the economic um, reform and development in their country and integrating themselves into the uh, world orders. So I think a lot of our fears maybe stem from if China were to be on top, would they just overthrow everything? What we kind of understand with the U.S. how we see ourselves in the world, but if China were to supplant the U.S. as the number one global power in many ways, um, then what do they see themselves as? Um, that's my question. Yeah, that's a good question. So I think you know Wang Zheng, and she's gone. Her her argument, uh, and this argument is not uncommon, is that. China, China does not see what is happening now, the Chinese government, as China's rise. It's rather, this is China's resurgence. This is China taking its normal place um, within Asia as the dominant power as it had for many centuries. And that, that Xi Jinping in particular wants to reassert that position. Um, on the other hand, I think there is much less clarity within China even about what that would mean in practice. Right. Does that mean that China is going to take territory? With the exception of Taiwan and a few places where there is these territorial disputes, I don't think so. Uh, is China going to support a tributary system where we do away with national sovereignty? Certainly not. China is definitely an advocate of national sovereignty. Um, and is China going to export its model of economic development? As soon as somebody can tell me what their model of economic development is, then maybe. But I also don't think this whole idea of a China model has been articulated or, or exported. I mean, there are certain aspects of China's economic development that have changed the way we think about development, like the role of the state right, can be much more positive than people were saying at the end of the Cold War. But I don't think that there is a China model that they are comfortable exporting. at least five or perhaps 10 more minutes for questions can be asked. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about what do you think in the future uh, Russia, like Russia's role will play in the Sino-US relationship? Uh, I'm addressing to the question that the reason was drawn from the start with Russia is actually there are a lot of media report mentioning that China is using it as a weapon to contain, <coughs> contain the US. So it has been a long time that Russia has been withdrawn from Sino-US rela relationship, but it seems like it has been revitalized. Right, um, and I think for people within the foreign policy world, people who are making policy now, um, one of their main um, criticisms of the Trump administration within the, within the military and the foreign policy um, apparatus is that um, our actions have driven Russia and China closer together uh, in a very, in a way that's very bad for the United States. Um, and that m may be something that is 
temporary because Trump in particular, his policies towards Russia have been particularly strange and may have more to do with his personal interests in, in Russia. Um, so I think that is a main concern of the, of the, of the non sort of, not the administration itself, but people within the government, um, that this is a, one of the negative aspects of Trump's unilateralism and also his alienation of, of allies, is that he has, um, he has made our, not just our global standing uh, worse, but he has also created opportunities for Russia and China to get closer together. As, and at the same time, um, made our allies feel less secure about the U.S. role in East, East Asia or in some parts of Europe. And for start, yeah, that makes it makes sense to me that this would be more about China and the military buildup regarding Taiwan. I think, yeah. Perhaps I could put this. Um, exchange on a uh, lighter note. A few weeks ago, Trump uh, boasted that she is more honorable, quote, unquote, end quote, than his domestic uh, opponents. Perhaps Trump is once again lying. <laughs> <laughs> but assuming he's not, what do you think is the correct interpretation of what he means when he says that she is more honorable than our congressional leaders, for instance? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I mean, I really try to avoid reading too many of his tweets because of mental health issues. Um, no, I that was over the, the government shutdown. I mean, I just, I, this to me is, is potentially less important in the longer term, but I think, per, but very important right now is that Trump admiration for autocracy is, is problematic for US foreign policy. And his denigration of US politicians as well as democratic the elected leaders like Angela Merkel and people like that is hugely uh, dis destabilizing and regrettable. But hopefully more of a personal issue of, of him rather than a longer term uh, disaffection in the United States for democracy. So I think we have room for one more question from the floor. Is there anyone who hasn't asked a question who would like to ask? Otherwise, I'll I'm more than happy to hand the mic. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, based on based on that question, I have a question further on. Is because she is becoming a more stronger leader personally, as well as Trump is behaving in a way that he likes to tweet. So that strengthens people's idea of personalistic aspects within the Sino-U.S. relationship. Uh, but we mentioned that before the foreign policy is not formed by two individualists. But what do people's perception of that Trump is playing ar around China and she is playing around the US, these kind of personalistic characteristic can result in the tension of a foreign policy. Does that make him the both leaders more likely not to back down on their decisions? Well, just to end on a more positive note, I actually think it is um, probably a very good thing for the U.S.-China relationship right now that Trump is weirdly admiring of Xi Jinping and, and, and has said, has never denigrated, as far as I can remember, not denigrated him personally in the same way that he has Kim Jong-un in North Korea where he called him fatty or rocket man or whatever. Um, because I think for, I think, you know, also to give Ch the, the Chinese government some credit, I think they have been much more restrained during the trade conflict than I would have expected. And I think it's partly because he has not gone down that road of personally humiliating Xi Jinping or, or denigrating him in, in tweets. In most cases, he, he will say the opposite. He'll bash China and then he'll say, Xi Jinping, my great friend. <laughs> and that's probably a, a good thing that he does that. So I've actually ended my talk with complimenting <laughs> Donald Trump. <laughs> So, uh, on that note, I wish to thank Professor Gallagher for an excellent presentation and for
Thank you to all for a very good and rewarding discussion. Can we give her a final applause before we disperse?